Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. My, I appreciate you've all got much more important things to do to, tonight. So we're going to um, keep to a tight 60 minutes. We're going to talk very much about um, the changes you can expect with regards to the FRCS Auth exam during the time of COVID. We've got, we're very privileged to have um, Stephen Easter Waring with us, who is the chairman of the Joint Committee on Intercollegiate Examinations for the FRCS Auth. who will give you an update of what to expect. We then have Ken Wong, who will give you a recent candidate's guide to the practicalities and logistics and some of the things you may not think about for the exam. And then Rishi Deer, who's um, a very um, enthusiastic and uh, speaker, will be talking about top tips for passing the exam. So with, I will pass you straight over to Steve. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for sparing your time to this. We're going to do a Q&A after each talk, so do feel free to ask any questions. I'll be as clear as possible. So um, <clears throat> as you'll appreciate, a bit of history. Prior to COVID, we had a, a very tried and tested exam pro, uh, portfolio. We had uh, robust data about how uh, quality assured the exam was. And then all of a sudden, and one, one of the key parts of this was having a whole bunch of patients turning up on the day of the exam to be examined de novo. And this would involve anywhere between 70 and 100 patients. Um, I know from my own experience, the South standing at Southmead at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning, um, it's quite an exposed position where you know you could just get a couple of people turning up and nobody else thinking it's Sunday. I won't bother. So it can be a bit stressful for the host, but but actually it's a great experience for examiners and candidates. Um, so <clears throat> COVID arrived. Clearly, the first diet through COVID in May. Um, of 2020 was cancelled. We if you remember, we were in the mire of, of, of everything just going chaotic in the hospitals. And then uh, it became apparent that there was increasingly a, uh, the risk of a backlog of A candidates who were, who were being delayed in their, in their progression towards consultancy. Um, and um, there was also this need for the NHS to have consultants on, on the ground to do the work clearing the inevitable backlog for all specialties, particularly in orthopaedics. So um, uh, John McGregor and Martin Owen, who are um, secretariat lead and, and chair of the uh, overall exam committee, um, sat down with us all and we, and we put a plan together to bring the exam to fruition in November of last year, where we went to Glasgow, <clears throat> we had a conference, a large hotel and conference centre to ourselves, and we put together an exam which had the same number of scoring episodes and the, scale, and the same, we hoped, robustness um, and actually that has been proven to be to be correct with uh, looking at the results that we gained from that experience. And we have, as you may well know, we have a further diet uh, this coming weekend uh, and we've got an extra diet to replace the February, which we lost uh, in June, beginning of June of this year. So we will have um, we'll have the three diets this year in total with November later on. Um, so a, a very short presentation just to uh, do the before and after. Um, so then and now. So prior to COVID, so Sunday, we, do, we the examiners all turn up on a Saturday evening. We do what's called standard setting, where we go through uh, the questions uh, in groups of, so the adult ortho viva, for example, will sit together. They'll go through all the questions which are going to be asked and they'll standard set, i.e. decide what candidates need to say, perform, what the what the information they need to deliver is to get a six, a pass mark, and then they'll go on and decide what, what constitutes a seven and an eight or, or a four or a five. And it's really important that we do that because as I say to all candidates, and you'll hear me, if you've not done the exam yet, you'll hear me say this in the briefing, you know, if you get a four or a five, you must not let it prey on your mind because it is recoverable. There's no such thing as a kill station. There's no such thing as a you get a bunch of fours, you fail no matter what. That does not exist. Absolutely does not exist. You can have an absolute nightmare on one question, get fours, and you can make it up. So it's important that we differentiate between fours and fives, and we differentiate between seven and eights, because getting an eight may well make the difference between a pass and a fail if you've gone down somewhere else. My own viva many years ago in, in adult, adult um, <clears throat> pathology was a series of histology slides. And it was a complete nightmare and a disaster. But, you know, I made it up elsewhere. And that is the case, I promise you. So the uh, the old format, uh, Sunday, uh, it will be clinicals. And the reason for that is we're hospital-based prior to uh, COVID. The hospital clinic rooms or wards were quiet or empty on a Sunday. 
uh, and we had the facility, the run of the facility. Plus, patients are not at work, etc. They're available to come in. So we do the clinicals, and then we do two, one and a half days of, of oral exams, Monday and Tuesday morning. Uh, and the format was two intermediate clinical exams on the Sunday, 15 minutes each, and then two short uh, uh, case exams, uh, each of which was three five-minute cases. Um, the orals were half an, half an hour each, and there were four of them. Uh, so that was the that was the old design. So we can't use hospitals now <clears throat> because of the whole COVID thing. Hospitals with COVID patients, we couldn't have a bunch of a descent, a bunch of 150, 200 people descending on a unit where they've got COVID patients and all sorts of infection protection mechanisms in place. There's a, a dearth of beds, etc. It's just not practical or sensible and just looks bad. So we're having to use non-hospital facilities and we've been using the conference centre and the big hotel in Glasgow. So um, this is what it looks like now. So the pro one of the problems before was if you had your Vive on a Tuesday morning, you had your clinic on a Sunday, you're hanging around um, for the whole of Monday. Previously a bit inconvenient but not a terrible thing. Nowadays, of course, we don't want people congregating together. We want people in and out as quick as possible to get them back home uh, with, with regards to social distancing, not mixing, etc., so we've taken the opportunity to follow the general surgeons who, who do this model where we have an oral examination on the Sunday. Those candidates will then do their clinical on Monday morning. Uh, we'll get a whole bunch of new candidates in at lunchtime Monday. They'll do their clinicals and they'll have their orals on the Tuesday. So people stay maximum of one night in the centre. They may want to come down on the Saturday night for the Sunday, of course, and maybe two nights. But generally, there's a really quick turnover. You're away from home for a minimal amount of time doesn't matter about the hospital facility because we're not using it, we're using a hotel. So <clears throat> the other changes, of course, are with the clinicals. We're not allowed patients at the moment. You can't have, just imagine the fallout if a, if a bunch, of bunch of patients got ill from COVID, having come to the examination or a bunch of candidates or examiners um, because of COVID, because a patient came in with a snuffle on a, 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 an undi or an undiagnosed COVID. So, so we were minimizing personnel and we still are, we still are at the moment. Um, so uh, the clinical is virtual clinical. Now we've 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 been very very clear with question writers uh, uh, that these need to be different from oral examination questions. And so the clinicals will involve a clinical pictures of patients with pathological conditions um, or video clips. Uh, so rather than having a patient in front of you, will you will have clear pictorial or video. Uh, information and then the Viva will go as per the normal clinical. There will be a, a history session, a, an examination session, and, and a, a decision making management session about around about five minutes for each. Now, clearly, the history it will be a case of uh, what would you ask the patient, what kind of details would you ask of the patient, how would you ask the patient about their pain, function, etc., rather than actually asking the patient. We, we have trialed. The, pay, the one examiner role playing that came back with relatively poor feedback. The candidates felt on, on some occasions that the they were unclear as to when the examiner was a patient and when they were an examiner. So we're going to suggest to examiners that, 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 you know, I would say X to a patient. I would ask the patient Y. So the patient tells you that, etc. The, 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 the demarcation is very clear. Examination will be what will you look for? Tell me how you would approach examination of the knee, etc. You may be asked to demonstrate on, on a virtual model, etc. Not an actual model, just in, in space. Where would you put your hands to examine X, Y, and Z? Um, and then the management question is clearly the same either way. Short cases, once again, clinical pictures or videos, and it'll be a what do you see here? What's the cause of, etc. Much no history as such. It'll be a, a, a spot diagnosis and then a, t a discussion about the causes and treatments of. So that's a little bit easier to do virtually. And there will be COVID precautions, of course. So we don't have lots of assessors hanging around. There's one assessor for the whole exam. We don't have training examiners sitting at your tables for the time being. It will return, but at the moment we're trying to minimise personnel gathering together, so there will be no extra person sitting at your table. There will be you and two examiners and that's it. Um, we all wear masks, uh, we all get temperature checked, examiners, candidates alike. Um, 
and actually it worked really well in November of last year. Um, the candidates were very positive about the experience. Um, so it's, 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 it's not entirely dissimilar. The marking scheme is exactly the same as it always was. So just the final slide, what has not changed? So the assessment, the educational assessment value and validity is unchanged. We know that we had a KR, we have a KR assessment from all our examinations. The KR assessment for this was indistinguishable from real patient examinations. It's, it's very educationally tight and, and highly quality assured. We have a whole panel of educational psychologists who look at all the data from all the exams. And it was an incredible amount of data that they sift through to make sure that we're producing a quality assured, valid exam. If you deserve to pass, you should pass. If you deserve, if you haven't done enough to pass, then you will probably be asked to come back. That's, that's what we aim for. You know, if, you're, <clears throat> if you've done the work and you have the knowledge, the ideal is that you get through. Uh, the, all the questions remain standard set by the examiner panel. The adult or five uh, examiners will sit together and decide together what constitutes a pass. So you don't, it should not be that if you go to one table and you perform X, if somebody else performs X at another table, we do not want them having a different result. The same performance should result in the same result, regardless of the examiner pair who you're seen by. So that's the importance of standard setting and every question, clinical or oral exam, will be standard set, as always occurs. The scoring system, the descriptors for the examiners are unchanged. There are 96 marking episodes for every candidate in every exam. And you will be seen by um, eight pairs of examiners. So 16 different examiners will see you. Now, occasionally it's 15, because if we have a candidate who's known to an examiner, we switch them. It's possible you may be seen by one examiner twice. But if that's the case, they will always be paired up with a different examiner. You will never see the same examiner pair. So most, pay, most candidates will have 16 different assessments. And the examiners do not discuss afterwards how you did and come to a conclusion. They ask, occasionally ask each other about, did X say Y or Z? I can't remember. Just remind me, did they discuss why factual correction or factual confirmation is asked, not an opinion as to the score? And so you are independently marked by 16 different examiners. And so, and if you get 576 marks, which is an average of six for each question, then you will pass. And if everybody in the room gets 576, you will all pass. This is not against you against your colleagues, it's you against the exam. And we can pass everybody if everybody gets the marks required. And, and to be quite honest, it's inevitably an anxiety-inducing hurdle in your life. It's, it's a high-stakes exam. People have worked for it for a long, long time. Of course, you're going to be anxious. But rest assured, the examiners will do as much as they can to get you through. They're very professional and they have to be robust because this is about patient safety. But... They, are, they do not try and catch you out. They do not go out of their way to be difficult. They do not make stupid remarks to people. We, 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 they're very professional about this. They give up their time over a weekend and the beginning of a week for nothing. They do not get paid for it. And they wouldn't do that if they weren't interested and genuinely educationally minded. So they will do their best to offer you the opportunity to deliver the information that you have. I can guarantee you of that. And, and, we, and we, we assess examiners all the way through. We train them properly. Um, to do this. They're not just brought in and say, oh, sit there and, and ask a few questions. It's a, it's a formal professional process. Um, so going forwards, uh, Glasgow is going to be used this coming weekend and again at the beginning of June. Um, it may well be a different venue next November. It's a bit unclear at the moment. We're still trying to work out where to hold it. It will not be a hospital venue. I don't think hospital venues will be used again, to be quite honest. I think it'll be a, a conference or hotel facility. Um, it will go back to rotating more than likely um, and um, certainly I can tell you <clears throat> given that winter's coming at the end of this year as it always does every year uh, we don't know what's going to happen in winter with regards to Covid, flu etc will there be a th fourth wave given the anxiety and given the fact we do not want to change and then change all over again we've got GMC approval the full college president approval to continue with this model of virtual clinicals, oral exams as normal, non-hospital facilities until and including the February 2022 diet 
after that, we hope to be able to return to using patients. Um, and that's, uh, other than urology, urology who've never used patients, that's the feeling of most exam boards. We would like to go back to using patients because it, it gives it gives more of a real life experience for the candidates and the examiners. There will be different, um, I think there will be fewer patients for social distancing, given that this could happen again. Um, and uh, to be able to use the facilities non-clinical facilities but there will be a return to patients at some point but for the next four diets so next this weekend june november february 22 it will be this model with virtual clinical assessments um that's about it i think i'm more than happy to clarify the new model or anything people have got to ask about the examination in general um just ask Thanks, Absolutely. Steve. That was very comprehensive, and it is, I think it addressed a lot of anxieties I had back ten years ago. About if you, it's nice to hear if you meet the pass mark, you're fine. You're Absolutely. Pass. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of questions that come in that were quite logistical questions, which are just asking um, when will we receive a confirmation for sitting in June, the June diet. Uh, so uh, sure, as, soon, as soon as possible after this this coming weekend, I would say. Okay. Thank you. And, and someone else asking, when are we notified of which day the oral exam will be? Uh, hopefully you'll know for, if you're doing this coming diet. Um, and they send you a thing out around about two or three weeks before with regards to what day you're expected. Okay. Thank you. Um, Nicole Corrin says, will it be suits or bare below the elbows? There are no patients. So no patients. So uh, the, uh, the advice is standard business tyre. So you don't need to be bare below, below the elbow. You can wear a tie if you're if you're a gent, or you can uh, you don't need to roll your sleeves up. You can wear a watch. Um, worth worth mentioning, and I will say this in the briefing prior to every examination. If you, please have a bag or something, or or somewhere we do give you a, a secure room for the candidates. We ask you to leave your phone in there, simply because it's it's you can't have people recording the examination, and we can't take the risk that they record the examination. Um, the reason for that is it's it's a it's a we do not want the exams questions being shared because if somebody passes because they've heard the question rather than because they have the knowledge once again it comes back to being a patient safety issue and uh, you know we, we it, the GMC are very clear about this uh, and they have asked to hear about people trying to cheat the system so they are really really conscious of this it, it, this is about passing an examination to a, to a, to allow you independent practice and it's clearly a patient safety issue and, and and because of that we have to be incredibly robust about the fairness of the exam you need to pass because you know it not because you know what the questions are in fact you know what the questions are the syllabus is out there it's written down it's online one last question um uh, people often basic science you can people draw draw pictures to explain yeah a whole variety of things is that still going on absolutely yeah now occasionally there will be some vir we do have some virtual exams where people in Ireland at the moment can't who can't travel over here we've done some virtual video examinations so they will have paper at their end they can demonstrate and draw a diagram the video as, as I'm sure everybody is aware on this call the video conferencing facilities are great these days we make sure we have a good robust internet connection and um so yeah drawing on paper there's still paper there's still pencils you will still be sat across a table from an examiner's um and you'll be wearing a mask but there's nothing to stop you drawing pictures perfect thank you very much steve that that's very really great uh that's great if you wouldn't mind just having a look at the q a whilst we go to the next talk of course, there's a couple yeah. of final things to clear up there yeah and then guys we're going to hand it over to ken wong so ken's um an east of england trainee who's um, at, at the end, has just put, done the exam recently. So Ken's going to share his experiences with us. And I'm looking forward to this. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I passed my. I hope you can see that. Um, I passed my exam uh, in November sitting, which is the first COVID sitting, and uh, it was a very new experience at the time. People were anxious. Sorry to interrupt you. You're not on full screen there. You might just want to go full screen. We're seeing a presenter view. Okay. Is that better? Perfect. Okay, so um, the, I, I'm just going to talk about my practical experience uh, of how the exam went. Um, so it, the exam's all the way in Glasgow, and uh, for those of us coming up from the south, the best way to get there would, uh, in my opinion, would be to take the train. 
uh, a train from London King's Cross is four and a half hours, which is exactly this amount of time you need to uh, skim reads uh, Ramachandran if you need to. Not that that works that very well. You should have the knowledge by then. Um, if you drive, you'll be tired. You'll waste half a day. Um, if you take a plane during COVID times, then you're someone who takes a plane during COVID times. So I recommend you just take a train. Uh, you can take a taxi and then make your way to your wherever you're staying. Of course, uh, as always, I recommend booking the hotel itself. Uh, not everyone might be able to get on it. That's OK. Plenty of good options nearby. Um, in the Crown Plaza Hotel itself, this is an actual view of what your room would look like. So just what you need. Um, it's upstairs from the venue. You need to just take a lift down uh, and then you're right there. The rooms are going for really cheap at the moment. I think it's a four star hotel and normally it costs about 290 pounds to book. But now, as of today, it costs about 79 pounds on some websites. So do try to book the exam venue um, just to eliminate any extra hassle that you need to think about in terms of travel, in terms of weather and, and all those things, in my opinion. Um, when you arrive to the hotel, this is a lobby. Uh, the lobby is all the way into the background where the reception is. And uh, that's why you book in. This is the canteen restaurant area where during lockdown, or, well, uh, early lockdown two in November when I sat it, um, this is where we spent breakfast, lunch and dinner. And this was true when the weather is very bad as well. If you look outside, the area around the Crown Plaza is quite sparse. So you can't exactly just pop out to the nearby takeaway or restaurant to get something to eat. Um, the best thing to do is to stay in the hotel venue and just to order. Um, for those who know Glasgow well, of course, if you if you know well, well enough to um, sort out your own transport, that's a completely different story. Um, here, traditionally, people were told to book the hotel venue uh, in order to see uh, the examiners and all the patients who might turn up into the canteen. That's obviously not the case in this situation where the, there are no patients whatsoever. When you're packing your bags, uh, don't bother bringing any of your goniometers or your tape measures because those aren't used in the exam. Uh, unless things have changed since my sitting, uh, all you have is an iPad, two examiners sitting in front of you, and you usually have a pen and paper in case you wanted to express things diagrammatically. Only use the pen and paper if you feel like it's going to help uh, in your uh, answer it's not you're not going to get extra points just because you've learned uh, a diagram uh, answer the question directly i didn't have time to vlog during my exam but uh, this is the actual exam hall uh, this is uh, a photo taken from the crown plaza website the room is that big and they arrange things in two long columns so there'll be rectangular tables uh, in two columns and then you'll be asked to um, go to your uh, assigned table where there'll be two examiners sitting you sit down there'll be 30 seconds or a minute of pause when you just take a breather then everyone's told to start and then you go uh, your strategy strategy thereafter which you've been practicing for the last few weeks or months would then be to just answer the question as people give it to you um, you're not allowed to touch the ipad so don't be tempted uh, say uh, I want to see another view or, or something like that. When you sit down, uh, you have two examiners in front of you. Um, it usually is one person uh, asking the question and one person marking. Um, if you had any inkling of uh, uh, interview technique, you'll know that uh, it's nice to make eye contact with both examiners uh, when you're delivering your answer. Um, the Art situation is, can be quite artificial. And uh, we've just heard from Mr. Uh, Easter Waring that uh, back in November, the exam was a bit awkward because you would have a consultant pretending to be 14 year old Abigail with a painful hip. Um, so that caused a lot of confusion. And now uh, you're, you're just asked to say, I would ask the, the patients X, Y, Z, or I would examine these sort of elements looking specifically for this. Um, Another artificial situation was, uh, during the last sitting was that you're not using both your hands to examine the patients. 
Um, if I ask you to do a Hoffman's test, you're not steadying a hand and you're not flicking the finger. Instead, you have to learn, you have to understand the test well, and you have to be able to um, articulate exactly what you're doing, what you're holding, what you're stabilizing. When I said I was doing the hook test for biceps, the examiner said, okay, so are you hooking from medial or lateral? So you have to be uh, ready to be, uh, to clarify these sort of points when you're challenged. In between the stations themselves, it's very, very quick fire. So um, by now you would have all had your timetables and then you can look at what sitting you're doing. You'll see that uh, you know there are uh, half an hour or an hour and a half slots where there is a kind of onslaught of just station after station after station. Um, there, there's actually a lot of waiting around time when you're moved as a group to different rooms like this one. Uh, you're sitting in a row with everyone else. Um, sometimes there's an awkward silence. Sometimes people are just catching up and trying to relax. Um, you can use that uh, downtime, uh, of which there is a lot during the exam, to just focus your thoughts and relax. In terms of uh, lunch during the day, I, this is something that came to my mind. Don't worry, they provide sandwiches. You don't have to bring anything. You don't have to prepare anything. Um, so there is, uh, there will be refreshments in between as well. You can have coffees uh, and you can have uh, water and there's plenty of time for toilet breaks. If you do uh, manage to book a hotel room in the Crown Plaza, uh, back in November, they were allowing people to uh, book the gym and spa facilities. So if you're the sort of person who doesn't like to be cooped up in your hotel room, uh, you, can, you can book your slots and just have a bit of time to relax in the evening, for example, after day one uh, or before day two, if your exam is in the afternoon, then feel free to use their facilities. Or uh, you can just go outside the hotel. As soon as you do, it's the river, it's lovely. Glasgow is very bright and airy. So you can give yourself a lot of headspace during that time. My, my advice, if I haven't said it already, is just to relax and look after yourself during exam. Don't bother bringing uh, heavy textbooks up or anything like that. Bring a laptop if you want to. Bring your last minute uh, flashcards or notes just to skim read. But don't bother cramming anything too much in the last 24, 48 hours before the exam. Uh, be early uh, to everything. Um, even if you are on time or slightly late, don't panic. Take one station at a time. They're very quick fire and you'll be turning your attention between two examiners um, and it'll be very, very quick fire. So just be succinct and just take it at, at a time. Uh, use your waiting time to unwind. Uh, like I said before, you'll have half an hour breaks when you're just sitting in that room. You can catch up with old friends. You can look at your notes uh, or you can just sit there and meditate. Do whatever you want to just relax. Uh, that being said, it, I did feel it was a very fair process. No uh, curveballs, no unfair questions, no nasty examiners. Uh, it should be fine. Work hard and good luck on that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ken. I feel we missed a trick by not giving a referral code for the Cramp Plaza. I imagine there's been an onslaught of bookings during your talk. Um, I declare no competing interests. And it's possible that cash has uh, frozen or I'm frozen. Yeah, I think cash is frozen. Um, sorry, I'm back. Um, sorry, guys, if you have any questions for Ken, please put them into the Q&A. Um, and then our last talk is going to be Rishi Deer. Rishi is going to... So Rishi is, a, as you can see, is talk about commitment. He's in his hospital bed, literally. And he's here to help you guys pass the exam. Rishi's kindly pre-recorded a talk for us on top tips for smashing the FRCS. I've seen it, it's brilliant. And he will be available for Q&A afterwards. So Rishi, we really appreciate you joining us, mate. Um, it's very decent of you and we'll get going with the, we'll play the video. And he's here for chat questions. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rishi Deer and I'm a consultant based at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow. And I'm here to talk to you about 
some top tips to pass the FRCS. And this is something I really focus on in my teaching company, Let's Talk Doctor. So I was really happy for Pete and Cash to ask me to speak to you guys today. Now, I'm going to give you not only some top tips to pass the FRCS, but hopefully to smash the FRCS, because that's the attitude I want you to go into this exam with. No fear. A quick disclaimer, all opinions are strictly my own. Everybody's an individual. So I'll give you some tips today, but it's important that you bring your own personality and ideas into the exam as well. And I don't apologize for any controversies yet. So I'm gonna to speak to you about a few of my commandments. And unfortunately, because of time constraints today, I can't tell you about all of them, but I'll give you a brief flavor. So firstly, thou shalt dispel the myths. Now, the FRCS is a really difficult time in your life and there's lots of mythology that exists around it and sort of irrational fear. But I'm here to tell you to dispel some of those myths today. Firstly, knowledge is the most important thing. We'll actually know. Part one, the MCQs are a knowledge exam, but part two is more about principles and technique. So that's the most important part of this exam. Secondly, the FRCS auth is difficult. Well, actually, the questions that you'll get, the so-called 90 percenters, as I call them, the majority of them are things you meet in your day-to-day -day life, such as cord requiner, carpal tunnel, CMCJ arthritis, things that are very commonplace and actually the weird and wonderful the skeletal dysplasias people very rarely fail on those and actually the frcs is often as difficult as you make it and finally the frcs is an exam i'm here to tell you that it is not an exam you might think he's crazy what do you mean but i'm here to tell you go into it with a different attitude so firstly, mano e mano, you're the candidate inside the cage and you're trying to stay in shallow waters. Face danger head on, be alert and don't bleed. Don't give the examiner, the great white shark, an opportunity to come into that cage. So try not to say silly things. The candidates who I've seen get into trouble are the ones who talk themselves into trouble in the exam. So it's important to stay very generic and also safe in your answers. I told you it's not an exam and I stand by that. This is a job interview. They are looking upon you at the other side of the table as a colleague, a day one consultant. So it's important to think of the examiner as a colleague who you're having coffee with and a day-to-day -day discussion because a lot of candidates go into this thing where they start fearing the examiner and they start talking to them as if they're their senior. It's important that you speak to them with respect but also as if they're your colleague and you're talking about a day-to-day -day case. And it is important that you stand out, but in a good way. Second commandment, thou shalt compartmentalize the way ahead. Now you've only got five minutes in this exam. And when you go into this exam, you've got about 10,000 facts in your head. It's a big jumbled up mess. So it's important that you take that mess and you convert it into a series of compartments which are much easier to recall. So I call that compartmentalization or signposting. And what I mean by signposting is where you give your subheadings to the examiner ahead of time so you can then talk through those subheadings. And it has twofold positivity. Firstly, the examiner is obligated to let you talk about those headings. So you are now in control of the viva. You have the so-called higher ground if you're looking at the Anakin Obi-Wan analogy from Revenge of the Sith. Secondly, the examiner will often say, tick and get you to move on so you can get onto further opportunity to score marks. So let's give some examples of compartmentalization or signposting. Open fracture management. Well, I would divide this up by saying, having resuscitated the patient appropriately, I would divide my management up into three distinct stages. Firstly, immediate wound care in A&E. Secondly, the first debridement. And thirdly, definitive fixation of soft tissue cover, which may or may not be done at the same time. Tell me about bone or cartilage. Well, I break it up into bone is a composite material which consists of organic and inorganic components. It can be thought of at both the macroscopic or microscopic level. And I would then break it up into organic and inorganic. A titanium nail. So you could talk about the formula of titanium and then break it up into composition, manufacture, properties, and uses. And I would use that for any biomaterial. Principles of tendon transfers, break it up into patient factors, 
donor, bed or recipient factors. And finally, you're a new consultant in a hip unit with a high infection rate. Break it up by saying, firstly, I would stop operating, do no harm. Secondly, I would do a root cause analysis to see if the problem is at the patient, surgeon or implant level. And finally, I would institute change, dividing it up into pre-op, intra-op and post-op. So if you're not sure of how to compartmentalize, some default type things you could use are break it up by chronology into pre-op, intra-op and post-op. For example, a Paget's total head placement or theater proportions. Factors. By cause, finally, patient, you surgeon or implant factors. High by guidelines, such as both guidelines or by number or anatomical site, for example, nerve compression. Third commandment, thou shalt be frugal with thine words. Going back to what I said before, this is a five minute station, whether it's a short case or a viva, or if it's an intermediate, it's three five minute parts, okay? So every single word that comes out of your mouth cannot be waffled. It's got to score you marks. So it's really important that you know the buzzwords and effectively, you can summarize things very quickly because they are looking to tick things off. And whenever I go into an interview, I think of three words to summarize every topic or these key words. So I'll give you some examples here. This is a Charnley or composite beam type prosthesis. So the key words would be a three point fixation, a single unit between stem, cement and bone and stress shielding. This is a triplane fracture. So the key words would be a Salter Harris four, a three in the AP, a two in the lateral. It's a transitional fracture and it's caused by differential closure of the physis. An MRI scan. Buzzwords would be nucleus spin, longitudinal and transverse magnetization vectors, and precession. An exeter hip or a force closed hip. Buzzwords would be polished, double tapered, controlled subsidence, and hoop stresses. So very quickly, I've summarized a big topic in just a few words, which I will then go on to explain. Commandment four, thou shalt structure thine answers. And this builds on what I've already said about compartmentalization and buzzwords, but let's take it that step further. It's really important, guys, that you know the scoring system when you go into the exam. And you might think, well, Rishi, that's being a bit noddy, but it's amazing how many people forget the scoring system and don't keep to their timing targets. So you can score effectively four to eight. Now, you're having to do either very badly or very well to score a four and an eight. So the majority of people are going to score the fives, sixes and sevens. And I want to get you up to the higher end of that rather than the lower end. So you've got to show evidence of higher order thinking, okay? So it's really important that your opening gambit, the first 30 seconds that come out of your mouth, pretty much determines your grade. If you say something very intelligible, you've passed and you're going on to a seven and an eight. If you say something disastrous, you're pretty much on a five and you're spending the rest of the five minutes trying to recover that up to a six at best. So it's important to know your timing targets. And so remember the film Saw, the opening gambit, do you want to play a game, is the key. So I've made a great mnemonic for you guys for this, the five Ds of deer that you can take into your answer to score an eight in the FRCS exam. So the first thing is, whenever you're given any prop in the exam, describe it. And so I always have an opening phrase. If it's an X-ray, this is an AP and lateral radiograph of the pelvis in a skeletally mature individual. It shows. This is a clinical photograph of both limbs in a child. It shows. This is an explanted specimen of a tibia. It shows. Okay, and when you describe something, you can describe it in terms of lower order thinking, a five, six. For example, this is a subtrochanteric fracture of the right femur. That will only ever get you up to a five, six, or you can show evidence of higher order thinking where you're not just thinking of the diagnosis, but the subsequent management. There is beaking of the cortices. There is thickening of the cortices. There is loss of corticomedullary differentiation. So not only is it a subtrop fracture, it's likely to be pathological, either Paget's or a bisphosphonate related fracture. That's the higher order thinking. Diagnosis, come to the diagnosis within 30 seconds, okay? You need to be hitting that time for that. Discussion. So I always think about this, guys. The discussion is you're driving along Route 66 and you're trying to reach your Nirvana, the 
gold at the end of the rainbow. But as you pass Route 66, you're seeing the shit on the side of the road, history, exam, investigations. Now, you have to acknowledge the shit, but you don't want to get stuck in it. So that's why you need sort of buzzwords to get you through this, okay? So I would take a pertinent history asking about risk factors and how the condition affects the patient. Be specific, don't just say, I would take a history. No, I would take a pertinent or focused history asking these questions, okay? Decide what is your actual management plan? And you need to be hitting this by two, two and a half minutes. And most of the time, they are looking for operative management by two, two and a half minutes. And finally, diagram if you can, usually in the basic sciences. Detective, show some evidence, some, sorry, show some uh, evidence to back up what you're going to say. Or discussion, many FRCS questions have a discussion point. And that's how you score an eight on FRCS, the five Ds of DEA. So, for example, putting this into practice, that's an open fracture. I've already described how I talk about it. So I'd say this is a clinical photograph of a femur which shows a completely denuded bone with extensive periosteal stripping. So it's at least a, um, a Gustillo and Anderson three open fracture, although I will formally be able to classify this at the first debridement, higher order thinking and diagnosis. Discussion. So I'm going to talk about my immediate wound care in A&E. First, uh, immediate wound care in A&E. So I'll talk about tetanus, IV antibiotics, etc. Decision making. So how are you actually going to manage it in theatre? OK, and then finally, evidence, detective, boast for guidelines. OK, rotator cuff arthropathy. The buzzword as I'm going to use is loss of acromiohumeral distance, femoralization of the humeral head, acetabularization of the acromion. OK, discussion. You're going to look at patient factors, disease factors. This is end stage disease. Decision making. OK, you might start with a suprascapular nerve block, but ultimately the only definitive treatment is going to be a reverse. And this will be a complex reverse because you've got extensive bone loss, retroversion and loss of the acromion as well. OK, and you can talk about evidence in terms of reverse for management of these conditions. OK, commandment number five, thou shalt work out where the question is going and lead the way. So when I answer an FRCS question, I always think, there's two ways of answering any question. Pitter patter is where the examiner will say something to you. You'll give something short and sharp back and it will be a back and forth, back and forth. And you'll never score more than a six. Lots of prompting is required. Now, sometimes pitter patter can be useful. So, for example, I was weak at skeletal displaces or tumors. So I was happy for the examiner to guide me through score no more than a six. But sometimes you know where the question is going. And so you can do something called anticipation and guidance where you take the examiner through the answer yourself. Yes, you won't talk for four and a half or five minutes if they stop you. But if they don't, then by all means, take them down the route of where it's going to go. So, for example, this came up in my exam. They asked me to talk about this and it's got a very clear route of where it's going. OK, this is a DEXA scan. So you want to know how it works. Talk about T scores and Z scores, what it's used for, osteoporosis. What is the WHO definition of osteoporosis? What are the guidelines for treatment? And the final question will always be, how do bisphosphonates work? So rather than working forward, I think of the last question and I work backwards. This is a perilunate dislocation. So the last question is going to be median nerve compromise or tendon transfers. So working forward, I'm going to think about Mayfield's classification. I'm going to think about checking the median nerve. Close reduction in A&E, that fails. Do I take them in the middle of the night or not? Close reduction in theatre, open reduction in theatre, and definitive fixation. Commandment number six, thou shalt beware the pitfalls. Now, guys, there are some questions where if you say something silly, it will be there to try and fail you. It's what I would call the pass-fail question. So you've just got to be aware of these. I'll give you some examples. So... This is a 55 year old gentleman who's been on the medical wards with hyponatremia, complaining of pain the last few days. The medics take an x-ray and ask you to see the patient. The failure mistake, as we can see here, light bulb sign, a posterior dislocation. The failure mistake would be to say that you would reduce it in the middle of the night. Why? Because if you didn't get further imaging, you'd hear a big crack. And that's because Anybody who's got a posterior dislocation of unknown chronicity is a locked posterior dislocation 
until proven otherwise. So you must get, must get further imaging in the form of an auxiliary view or a CT. Otherwise, you've got the potential of causing a proximal humerus fracture with a closed reduction. So that is a failure mistake. Commandment number seven, thou shalt know the rules and stick to them. And we're coming to the end now, okay? So know the rules. You've always got to stay in shallow waters. Don't go complex. Start simple first and then go complex. So what I mean by that is you cannot score the eight before you've scored the six. And the six is always the safety question. They want to check your safe first. So for example, in a unifacet dislocation, you need to talk about getting an MRI and referring to the neurosurgical unit before you start going on about evidence and Smith Robinson approaches, et cetera. Start simple and then go complex. Listen to the question. How would you manage this? Not what are the 10 options? How would you manage this specific patient? So even if they've got a smashed up calcaneal fracture in a 25 year old, if it's someone of no fixed abode, IVDU, high smoker, diabetic, you're probably going to treat this non-operatively, even though the fracture might suggest that it needs fixation, or at best you'll do a percutaneous fixation and minimize soft tissue stripping. Don't argue with the examiner. Now you can have a disagreement that is by all means acceptable, particularly in the trauma viva, but don't argue. Even if the examiner is wrong, just say, okay, thank you. And you can move on to the next part. You can pass or recant, but I would say once or twice, not all the way through your vivas. So if you say something stupid, don't keep going down the rabbit hole into Wonderland. Stop the examiner and say, I'm so sorry, I've made a mistake. Can I please recall? So finally, guys, take a leap of faith. You're all going to be great next week. Don't be afraid. Remember the 90 percenters. Try and know those common questions the best, because that's what's going to decide whether you pass or fail this exam. Now, I could only tell you about a little bit of stuff today, but if you have any further questions, please feel free to email me on letstalkdrrishi at gmail.com. Check out my website, or I'm also on Twitter or Facebook, so please smash a like on that and um, give me a shout. And these are some of our courses that we do as well, including the Blitz course coming up in a couple of weeks for people doing the June exam. So thank you very much. I wish you all the best for the exam in a week's time. And I'm sorry, Pete, I've gone slightly over there as well. Um, but best of luck, guys, for the exam. Hey, Rishi, thanks, man. Um, yeah, Rishi, um, a question has come in on the uh, chat just saying, should we have a specific shoulder implant or reverse implant? That'd be our prosthesis of choice, as one may do in a hip. So, so what they're looking for, really, I mean, my understanding is, um, Stephen, maybe I'll just correct me on this, is with the implants, they're not looking necessarily for what your choice is. They're looking for, do you understand the principles behind using that choice? So for me, with a shoulder, I wouldn't worry too much about an implant. What they want to check is, do you know the difference between an anatomical and a reverse? And do you know the different indications of using the following? So for example, an anatomical would require an intact cuff, somebody who hasn't got inflammatory disease and hasn't got extensive retroversion. I wouldn't really want to, as a shoulder surgeon, I wouldn't be expecting people to know specific implant types. I would want them just to know general indications and roughly how a reverse works. You're medializing the center of rotation. And I think it's the same with a hip and a knee. You want to know really about philosophies, a posterior stabilized versus a cruciate retaining. It's not so much about them knowing which implant they use and having to choose the correct implant. Is that correct, Stephen? Would you, would you say the same or? You're on mute, on mute, Steve. Absolutely agree. Um, so it's about, you know, bearing in mind, you, you know, you're, you may well, you're not going to be examined on a shoulder by a shoulder surgeon most of the time. You'll be examined by somebody like me who's a hip surgeon. And they're, they're, they're not after, you know, the latest thing from Dupuy Striker, etc. They're after the philosophy. Why are you doing a reverse? What's the indications? Just as Richie said, if you're saying that, that's, that's what they want. They don't want the detail. They're not going to ask you about the detailed broaching techniques of the latest model even if they're a shoulder surgeon they may not have that in their unit it's it's not about that it's about it's about philosophies and indications so ev evidence your answers i think i answer i answered a question that came up which said um can they ask you you know are you sure so so you know what they're looking for if they say if they look at you and they say are you sure what they're looking for is you to evidence an answer so exactly the same way. So as Rishi says, you know, they want you to evidence why you're using a reverse geometry shoulder in this particular question instance 
and not not an anatomic you know why are you doing that not 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 why you're using a particular implant that really is not important the other questions come up um, that I'll put to you first and then to Rishi. It says, do we need to present evidence to be able to score an eight? I think it's a question that comes up time and time again about quoting papers. Yes, yeah, so I think, I think, I think <clears throat> being aware of the literature is not, is not necessarily required. We don't have an academic station like the general surgeons do. So I think being aware of various literature is not required for a pass. I think that kind of knowledge is required to get score highly. I think scoring eight sevens and eights is is you you are safe as a day one consultant, um, as an independent practitioner, on call in the middle of the night. That's the kind of philosophy, uh, or on your own in a theatre dealing with an elective case. Um, the the sevens and eights show that you are aware of literature, you're aware of evidence, why you would do something. Um, the up-to-date evidence, the, the dealing with a complex case in, in a subtle way. It's, uh, so I, if I were the candidates here today, I would focus on getting a six, focus on passing. And anything in addition to that, to get you above that line, is great because it allows you to go down somewhere else on inadvertently. So um, yes, do as well as you can, but I wouldn't... And, and where you can quote evidence, I wouldn't start trying to quote papers you're unsure of and getting them wrong. Because if you start doing that, people then start to doubt. If you, they start doubting you because they're aware of a paper, you're quoting it incorrectly. They may then start to doubt about everything you said. So if you're going to quote and you know the evidence well, great, fill your boots. If you're going to start quoting about things you've heard on the grapevine from colleagues, you're not quite sure and you haven't read the paper, you don't, you've read the summary, you don't know the paper in detail, you don't want to get into a philosophical argument about a particular paper, which may be controversial. Thank you. Rishi, what's your approach to managing evidence and papers? So I, I would be exactly the same. So evidence should be something where it's it's almost the thing of you're not, you can't polish a turd. You can't use evidence to basically cover up the fact that you're about basic knowledge. They want to test, are you safe as a day one consultant? So I found evidence useful in the trauma viva. If there was a scenario, for example, with a major paper like draft or the UK heel trial or proffer. Now, as a shoulder surgeon, I could I could argue against many different types. I could argue against proper, but it's something that I would expect people to be aware of because it, it does inform decision making in a number of units. Um, so I would expect people to maybe know about some of those major trials. If they are arguing against the examiner in a certain way or they have a local way of doing things in their unit, then as long as they've got some sort of evidence, and that may be boast guidelines. It may not be papers to back up what their decision making is. That is what I would say. But what I wouldn't say is try and throw papers out there before you've got the six, before you've got the safety question. Mm -hmm. They want to test, are you safe as a day one consultant to manage this? And even if you throw papers out, that won't cover up um, if you don't get the basics, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. No, appreciate it. We're going to take one more question from there, then I'm going to ask you one. It's, there's a question that's come in that says, is a better or timer going after five minutes in the intermediate cases um, as we're not examining a real patient could overrun? Steve, would you, or Ken, would you know? So there is a, um, it, so in the re, in the exam where you have patients, there's a bell for the short cases. The examiners, uh, the, the co-examiner will often give a nod to the examining examiner um, in an intermediate to get them to move on. Because sometimes, it depends on the case. Some cases, you know, the, the history will be six minutes worth because there's loads of detail. The examination may actually be relatively small pry and the discussion is the big thing at the end. So the, the, there's flexibility for the examiners to, you know, adapt within, within some constraints and get as much information out of the candidates as possible. Comes back to them trying to give you the best chance to pass, really. And um, now, since we're all in a big room, there will probably be a bell because it's a virtual exam now, of course. There'll be a bell for the short cases, which will inevitably be heard by the intermediates so there will be a bell now the examiners may choose to run on slightly after that bell in the intermediates because there may be some really good details in one portion of the intermediate which is worth spending some time on so um, i wouldn't be held up about how much time is being spent the examiners will do the the timekeeping and the moving on the co-examiner is not only paying attention to what you're saying and marking is also uh, uh, he or she's also doing some you know logistical help for the person who's focusing on the questioning you Ken, can I ask you, if you were doing the exam on Sunday, four days time, what would be your last minute tips if anyone is sitting it? 
I would say don't tr try to cram. Um, if your knowledge is not there by now, then it's not there. Instead, just try to look after yourself, look after yourself mentally, get some rest, get some sleep, uh, get some exercise, eat well. Okay. Um, and don't stress, you know, get the logistical stuff like ironing the shirts, hanging things up, do them as soon as you arrive and then you've got some clear space. Okay, thank you. And Steve, would you like to add something? Absolutely. So the one thing I would say to people, so you can have all the knowledge in the world. There is one exam technique. People haven't really talked about exam technique. Um, well, we did quite a good it's chunk on some of it. But, but the one thing I think is worth mentioning, it's highly likely that everybody listening to this will go down on one area of the examination. You'll do badly. You'll ask something you've not seen, you've not heard of. You have a blank for whatever reason. You know it, but you just can't articulate it and you're frustrated and annoyed at yourself and you know you've done badly. That happens to most people. It happened to me with my slide driver. And, and it's an awful feeling. You know, you've worked to this point. It's a horrible feeling. The exam technique you need to develop, whether that's sitting in front of your consultants this rest of this week and having some practice drivers, and I would recommend sitting in some front of someone you don't know, ideally. Practice doing badly because the trick is to go into the next question fresh you have to forget that bad experience put it completely behind you that is finished it's done with all you if you've got a fours you just need to get some sevens somewhere in the whole examination to make up for that it's totally doable so please do not fall apart like a house of cards which which, which it can happen you just need to practice and remember my words you can make stuff up you have a whole exam bar one section to make stuff up that's a lot of time and it's a lot of scores so please do not focus on something that goes badly and most people will however good you are something will catch you out at some point otherwise we're not doing our jobs properly because we're trying to get you to it and actually remember you think you've done badly you may have scored a six instead of a seven or an eight it, we know lots of literature out there showing that people are in, incredibly bad at judging how they've done in examinations. So actually, you may feel destitute. You may have scored a bunch of sixes. So please don't let what you perceive as a bad result in one section cloud your rest of your examination. You've got to clear your head, start again. That's a, For me, that's the best thing you can do and the most useful single behavioral change you can make. That's brilliant. And I think that's the best place to leave it there. Um, I hope that we decide, we set this up at short notice off the hub because we really wanted to address any anxieties and just help everyone sit in the exam. I'm very, very grateful to the speakers for giving up their time today. Um, I think um, it's been a, a very useful session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Good luck with the exam to everyone who's seen it. And um, I, I'm not plugging anything, but if you do have any downtime or you want to get a break from it, do listen to the podcast and just try something different. And on that note, good evening. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, everybody. Good luck, everyone.